Howdy folks, it's been a while since I did one of these. Welcome back to World of Tanks with the Mighty Jingles. It's time for a tank review. Today, we're going to be taking a look at uh, one of the two American Tier 8 tank destroyers, the T-28. The other one, of course, being the T-28 prototype. Uh, the major difference being that the T-28 prototype has a turret and the T-28 doesn't. Why the hell would I want to get the T-28 then? Good question. The T-28 has better armour. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't. <laughs> but we'll um, we'll take a look at that in Tank Inspector later on, and I'll show you what I mean. Um, the T-28. So, historically, this thing was a prototype. Uh, it never saw service. It was designed as a super heavy tank uh, for breaching the defences of the Siegfried Line during the uh, assault on the Western Front in World War II. Never saw service, never made it, to Europe. This and the T-95, which you get at Tier 9, the infamous Doom Turtle, are basically the same machine. T-95 is just a T-28 with an extra set of tracks uh, and a new name. Um, and we'll show you the exact difference between the two of them later on again in Tank Inspector. So, you've been grinding your way up the American Tank Destroyer line because Maybe you'll like the look of the T-95, the infamous Doom Turtle at Tier 9, or the T-110E3 at Tier 10. You've had loads of fun with the ferociously quick and borderline overpowered T-49 down at Tier 5. Then you've gone down the, what is technically the non-turreted American Tank Destroyer line at Tier 6 with the M36 Jackson, which is nowhere near as fast as the T-49, but it's certainly not slow, with a 42 km per hour speed limit and has a great 90mm gun. At Tier 7, you've got the T25AT, which will do 56 km per hour, and has a great 105mm gun. And then suddenly the brakes come on at Tier 8, when you see this thing will only do 18 km per hour. That's not 80, that's a 1 and an 8. 18 km per hour. In fact, it probably actually won't do 18 km per hour. It rarely reaches that speed. It will not go any faster than 18 kilometers per hour. It's a, well, at least a 60 ton machine, can weigh up to 68.7 tons, and it only has a 510 horsepower engine. This was designed as a super heavy breakthrough tank. It was designed to punch through the German defenses on the Siegfried Line on the Western Front in World War II. It never saw service, it never actually reached the European theater of operations. It was only a prototype, it ended up not being needed and was left to rust. And it is slow. It is really, really slow. On the bright side, it's not as slow as the T95, which is the next one that you get at Tier 9. That thing will only do 13 kilometers per hour. Oh my god. But anyway, the T28. It also doesn't turn particularly quickly either, with a 20 degree traverse, even with the upgraded suspension. Now, as far as the armour of this thing's concerned, well, it, this is one of the main selling points. It's one of the main reasons why people will say, yeah, get the T28 and not the T28 prototype. It has 254 millimetres of armour at the front. The T28 prototype only has 203. Hmm. Is that a fact, is it? Well, technically, yes. But really, uh, no. Now let's have a look in Tank Inspector, and I'll show you what I mean. Don't believe everything you read about the armour of your tanks in the World of Tanks garage. 254mm of armour on the front of this thing? Bullshit. Well, it does, but it may as well not have. The 254mm of armour on the front of the T-28 is... Where's it gone? Well, it's there. It's behind the gun mantlet. Now, that does mean this thing has a very, very well armoured gun mantlet, because... The mantlet itself is 203mm of spaced armour, and then the cap behind the mantlet is 254 But who shoots at the gun mantlet? <laughs> Nobody with any kind of sense is ever going to shoot at the gun mantlet of a T-28. In effect, the frontal armour of the T-28 is 203mm, exactly the same as the T-28 prototype. So, yeah, I think I'd rather have a turret. <laughs> Um, the armour situation at the front is pretty good, but 203mm and it's mostly flat. 
there aren't many things that are going to have problems penetrating that. 133 millimeters lower glaciers. However, it is very, very well sloped lower glaciers, and it's not a massive target. And if a T28 is pointing his gun right at you, and you aim at the lower glaciers from the front, even unangled, it's still the equivalent of over 250 millimeters of armor. So where should you shoot a T28 if you're firing at it from the front? Well, you shoot for the parts that are only 102 millimeters thick. Here. The hatches on the top. That is, if you're not guaranteed to penetrate 203 millimeters of armor, then you just aim here. Right now, they are kind of rounded, 102 millimeters raw thickness. But thanks to rounding and sloping, well, it's still not that much better. Anything from 130, depending on where you hit it, to well, 130 basically. Pretty much anybody, if they can hit them, can penetrate these two hatches on the top gets progressively worse when you move around to the sides. That's only 51 millimeters thick. And if you thought that was bad, well this is the reason why artillery absolutely loves shooting at T-28s. They are big, they are slow moving, it's very very easy to lead a shot even on a moving T-28, and the top armor is 25 millimeters thick. It is absolutely terrible. This thing is a massive artillery magnet. The 18 millimeters of armor, well, the viewports basically. But if you're aiming for those, there's something wrong with you. You want to be aiming here. While we're here, um, just take a quick look and show you the exact differences between the T28 and the T95 in reality. Well, in reality, there were no differences. They're the same machine. Just two different prototypes of the same machine that were renamed the T95 gun motor carriage in 1945, as it says up here in uh, Tank Inspector. The T95 is the T28. It's just the T28 with a new name and an extra set of tracks. And that's pretty much it. It's the only difference. Oh, and some spaced armor stuck over the side just to accommodate the track extensions. Other than that, they are exactly the same machine. The real thing never used this 155mm gun. They were both 105mm gun armed prototype super heavy tanks. So, the moral of the story is never take Wargaming's word for it when they tell you that your machine has 254mm of frontal armour. It doesn't. It's got exactly the same frontal armour to all intents and purposes as the T28 prototype. And the T28 prototype has a turret, and it's no slower. So, what's the point of getting the T28? Well, that's a bloody good question. Um, the T28 prototype is a better machine, and it's not that good. <laughs> Um, I like the T28 prototype. Uh, I've had some hilarious games in it, but it's not a very good machine, and it's better than the T28. <laughs> um, uh, this really is a pretty bad tank, and yet I do kind of like it. Um, but again, back to the question, what's the point in getting the T28 over the T28 prototype? Well, not a lot, but it does have one advantage over the T28 prototype. As is typical with the differences between turreted and non-turreted tank destroyers, if two of them are at the same tier, and they both use the same gun as these two do, then the non-turreted one gets better gun performance. It doesn't get better penetration, it doesn't get better damage, but the reload, accuracy, and aiming time are almost always better, and that is the case here with the T28. The gun on the T28, which is exactly the same as the gun on the T28 prototype, or the upgraded gun, the 120mm AT Gun T53, has a 6.59 rounds per minute rate of fire, the same 248 penetration and 400 average damage, 0.38 accuracy and a 2.1 second aiming time. But the difference between the two, considering that the T28 prototype has a turret, is not that great. The same gun on the T28 prototype has a slower rate of fire, 5.94, same penetration and damage. The difference in accuracy is 0.39 versus 0.38. There's hardly any difference at all. And the difference in aiming time, well, 2.1 versus 2.3. 2.3 is still a good aiming time. There's nothing wrong with that. So are the differences between the gun performance on the T28 prototype and the T28 enough to justify getting this thing when you could get that thing? No. <laughs>
No, they're not. <laughs> um, there is one other thing, however, that needs to be mentioned to do with the difference in performance between the two machines. And that's that the T28 prototype is an open topped vehicle. So you cannot fit enhanced ventilation to an open top vehicle. You couldn't fit it to the M36 Jackson. You couldn't fit it to the Hellcat. You could fit it to the T25 AT and you can fit it to the T28. And that extra 5% on all your crew skills means that in practice with a gun rammer, my actual reload time on the T28 is 7.68 seconds. My actual reload time on the T28 prototype is 8.72 seconds. So yeah, you can get significantly better gun performance, um, better rate of fire, better damage per minute out of the T28 by fitting enhanced ventilation than you can the T28 prototype. But it costs you 600,000 credits to fit enhanced ventilation to the T28. The T28 prototype gets the turret for free. <laughs> It's just a better machine than the T28. The difference between the guns are just in no way, shape or form good enough to compensate for not having a turret on this thing. As far as research goes, it's kind of a good news, bad news situation. The good news is that unlike on the T28 prototype, you will at least have this 105mm gun already unlocked from the T25AT. T28 prototype drivers have no such luck. They still have to use the 90mm gun from the T25 II before they even unlock the gun that you're going to get for free because you unlocked it at tier 7. Unfortunately, the bad news is that you can't fit the 120mm gun, which is what really makes the T28 shine, until you've unlocked the suspension. So, there's that. The T28's a funny old machine. It doesn't really have the effective frontal armour to lead a spearhead, unless it's a top tier tank. You don't want to be doing it in a tier 9 game. 203mm of effective frontal armour, anything at tier 9, will just laugh at you and put hole after hole through the front of this thing. Um, it works well as a sort of mid-range, second line, behind the heavy tank, uh, mid-range support tank. If it's top tier, it can lead a spearhead, but that's relying on your teammates to actually follow you and back you up. You don't want to be going anywhere alone in this tank. It just gets outflanked, overwhelmed, shot up in the sides, detracked, immobilized, and killed. You have to plan your moves very, very carefully if there's artillery in play, because artillery loves shooting at T-28s. It is definitely not a newbie-friendly tank. There are so many different priorities you have to be juggling when you're driving this thing. Do I have teammates near me? Can I afford to make a move? Uh, what's going on on the map? Is the battle getting away from me? Do I need to break cover? What's artillery doing? <laughs> More so than most other machines, when you're driving a machine as slow as the T-28 and the T-95, you have to become a master at reading the minimap and planning your moves well in advance. And a lot of the time it will come to nothing because the rest of your team races off and either does very, very well and there's nothing left for you to shoot at or does very, very badly <laughs> and suddenly you're alone against overwhelming numbers of enemy tanks. It can be an intensely frustrating tank to drive. But that's true of all slow machines in World of Tanks and it isn't going to get any better at Tier 9. The T95 is even slower. T95, however does at least have the effective frontal armour to be able to spearhead and lead an attack. The T28 is a pretty bad tank, but I've had some fun in it. Let's take a look at some games. But first, pop quiz. If the game tells you that a gun does 400 average damage, that doesn't mean it's going to do 400 damage with every shot. It can do up to 25% less and up to 25% more. What therefore is the minimum possible amount of damage that you can do with the 120mm gun on the T28. And if you said 300 from a 400 average damage gun, then give yourself a cookie. Frankly, I think I deserve my money back from that shot. And then it does it again. <laughs> I have to put three shots into this guy when he should be dead after taking two hits. Now, I'm not for a second saying 
that the 120mm gun on the T28 has been intentionally coded to constantly produce low damage rolls, but holy shit. In my experience, this gun is even more temperamental than the BL-10 on the ISU-152. But anyway, on with the first proper replay. Now, this is one of my first games in the T28. This was back in patch 8.6. Unfortunately, because it's such an old replay, I can't quite get it to run properly, so I have to show you this match in external third-person camera view. I can't actually go in a first-person sniper view at all. I'm platooned up with uh, Fosh in the AMX 5100, Circumflexes in the IS-3. It's a tier 8 maximum game. Unfortunately, they have to abandon me to my own devices, because that's just what you have to expect if you're platooning with a T28. You can't expect the rest of the guys in, their platoon, in, in your platoon to just drive around at your slow snail's pace. So they're pretty much going off to do their own thing, and I'm not really going to see them again until right at the end of the battle. There was some bizarre behaviour in this battle, though. For a start, where's that KV-5 going? He doesn't really appear to know, but keep an eye on our artillery. Note that the ISU-152 in front of us has the stock gun. He's still using the 152mm howitzer from the SU-152 at Tier 7. Our other ISU has the BL-10, but he doesn't last very long. Now, I'm sticking to the lower ground here to try to take advantage of those bushes in front when I pop up to take a shot, but have a look at the Hummel. What, what is he doing? Can he seriously have been playing artillery for this long? <laughs> and he's still going in direct fire mode against... Oh, I don't know. So anyway, now we've got no artillery. Great. And despite my efforts, somebody has spotted me, uh, and there was some fire coming in. There we go. It's probably the T-44 over there who saw me. My first shot at the enemy T-34, misses. Then I bounce a shot from a Lerva, reload, and, oh look, a below average damage roll. You're going to see a lot of that in the course of this replay. I swear I'm cursed when I'm driving this tank. I have done well in this tank, but it seems to be, you know, despite the game, <laughs> trying to ensure that, oh look, another below average damage roll. <laughs> You're going to get very sick of me saying that before this match is over. It's as if the game just does not want me to do well in the T28. And he's like, no, you're not allowed to get any kills. No, 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 sorry. No, he's going to survive this shot. And he's going to survive the next one as well. <laughs> it's just... Ah, world of tanks, you're so silly. Pay attention to the map, by the way, particularly down by the coast on the west. We've got a T29 and an IS, and they're about to run into the enemy. Jag Tiger 88 and T28 prototype, and it's not going to end very well for them. We're going to see more of them later. There we go, got the T34. Uh, and I've bounced every shot that's hit me so far. And this is, this is the ideal kind of circumstances in which to be using the T28. Keep them at medium to long range. Only get involved in close range fights with other tanks when you have backup or when you have no other choice. KV-5 has just gone to get shot in the flank by the T-44. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> and I completely missed that shot. 0.38 accuracy is not fantastic. kv 5s dead. Guys down on the beach are... Well, I'm not really in a position to help them. Or I could, but it would take me far too long to get there. I can't just drive straight down at the beach because that involves turning my back on this T-44. And I'd have to go the long way around and come up behind them. And the chances are, well, they'd be dead by the time I got there anyway. I'm going up, now that the guys on the ridge line at the back are no longer threatening us, I, I'm going up to try to engage this T-44. And I'm, I'm kind of hoping that our T-44 will, you know, fast medium tank and all that, will do something about it and help. but. I'm not exactly in the ideal tank to be challenging a, a fast medium face to face. Although, to be fair, he is kind of pinned in position up there. He can't really abandon the spot that he's in without taking a savage kicking. We've, we've got tanks all around him. 
he moves behind the uh, ruined Colosseum and I am at this stage actually playing chasey chasey, catchy catchy, kissy kissy <laughs> while artillery misses me um, against the T-44 and he, he times this spectacularly well right there, that's when he pops out, right when I can't actually shoot him because this wall is in the way but there's a hole in the wall our T-44's come out, and I'm waiting for him to clear the other side, bang. Oh, look, would you believe it, a below average damage roll. <laughs> ah, God. Well, he's trying to get out, which is the only sensible thing to do at this stage. Our T-44's going after him, the uh, ISU-152 is also coming after him. I'm desperately trying to catch up, and now, oh look, he's got less than 400 health. Surely this is a kill. Another below average damage roll. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you couldn't make this shit up. Now, at this stage, and the guys that were down on the beach are pinging the map furiously. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, you're right, I've forgotten about them. The Jagdtiger 88 and the T28 prototype. And yeah, okay, fine. I heard you the first 15 times. I'm turning around, I'm heading back because the Jagdtiger 88, T28 prototype are slow machines as well but the two of them are probably approaching our cap circle right now so um, we've lost circumflexes at this stage Fosh is still alive, he's just nailed the enemy ISU, the only thing left over there is a T29 the Jagdtiger 88 and the T28 prototype probably sticking together and hey, you know slowest machine on the team, of course Why? <laughs> who else would you expect to go back and yes we get it, I know, I'm going back, please shut up already Guy spamming chat there, that really annoys me. But yeah, sure, I mean, you know, I'm the slowest tank on the team. Sure, I'll be the one to go back and reset the cap. Fosh is going around to engage and kill the T-29, since he was already up in the enemy base, and he's the closest one to the T-29. And if the T-29 is coming back to try and cap as well, I am going to be in serious trouble. So Fosh heads back to deal with him. Our ISU, of course, starts capping. Can't really blame him. I mean, I would have preferred if he'd come back to help me against two tier 8 tank destroyers, but he didn't. Um, and now he's far too far away from the action to get any more shots in on the remaining tanks. So he's gone to cap, and fair enough. Also, there's absolutely no guarantee that I'm going to kill these two guys. I mean, I'm on full health. I'm probably going to kill these two guys, but I don't know how much health they have. So him capping also provides us with an insurance policy. Voss just nailed the T-29, so he's now reloading and at the same time trying to come back to attack the cap from the other side. And there's the Jagdtiger 88 and he has full health. I bounce his first shot. I'm not taking any chances here. I need every shot to count. I have loaded gold ammo. Because there's probably going to be two of them there and I can't afford a single bounce or I'm dead. Jagdtiger 88 thinks he's hidden in the bushes. He's not. And lo and behold, a below average damage roll. And right then is when the T-28 prototype suddenly appears. But I can kill him with one shot, as long as I don't get a below average damage roll. <laughs> and that's going to cost me a lot of health, because I've got no doubt that these guys have now switched to gold ammo, and I have to waste time putting another shot into the T-28 prototype. And another one, and finally, when it's not good enough to kill him, I finally get an above average damage roll, but now Fosh has appeared on his flank, he puts one into him, and I finish him off. And most surprisingly, and I totally didn't expect him to do it, and would not have begrudged him if he had stayed in the cap circle, but the ISU-152 actually gave up his invader points in order to allow us to get the kills which was incredibly unexpected and nice of him. It's just not the sort of thing you expect to see happen in random battles. You expect more of, well, like the IS player, who did less than 400 damage in the game and then had the nerve to call all us noobs, you know? <laughs> That's the sort of thing you expect to see happening in random battles, not people giving up their own chance to get XP and credits so that uh, the rest of the team can get some more kills. So thank you very much to the ISU-152 driver. And, well, yeah, there it is. Uh, one of my earliest games, back in patch 8.6, in the T28. Steel Wall, Defender, 3,400 damage done from 11 penetrating damage.
damaging hits. And at the risk of sounding like a broken record here, hmm, 400 average damage, 11 penetrating damaging hits, 3,400 damage done. Surely that should be 4,400 damage done. Ah, yes, Jingles. Ah, but what you're failing to take into account, Jingles, is that some of those shots were just finishing shots against targets that were already on low health. Well, yes, I take your point, and it's a good one. But my point is that if the previous shots hadn't been below average damage rolls, I wouldn't have needed to take the finishing shots against the low health tanks, because they'd have been dead. You know, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm not pissed off or anything. Much. However, in the interests of complete transparency, because the last thing I want is everybody going around the internet saying Jingle says the gun on the T-28 only ever rolls low. Voila! 494 damage, which ain't bad for a gun that's supposed to do 400. 500 is the absolute most you're ever going to score with this gun, so it doesn't get much better than that. Second proper replay is courtesy of this guy here, Super De Boer. He does not have a fully upgraded T28. He's got the engine, you can tell he's got the engine because this thing is actually moving. If he didn't have the engine it wouldn't be. But he doesn't have the gun yet, that's the 105mm gun from the T25AT at tier 7. Now he's platooned up with another T28 driven by Master Killer 963. That's him there, he does have the 120mm gun. This game starts off entirely predictably badly. I'm kind of expecting the T-21 to suicide scout and drive his tank straight towards the biggest cluster of enemy tanks. Didn't expect to see it from the T-43 driver as well, but World of Tanks continues to surprise me on a daily basis. And in fact the T-43 I think is the first one to die. It's not as if he doesn't know all of those tanks are there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there we go. T-43 is dead already, and soon to be followed by the T-21. There he goes, and then KV-1S driver, again, not the sharpest tool in the box, thinks that driving across the middle of an open field, right in front of a massive cluster of already spotted enemy tanks, is a smart move. He joins them too, so we're losing 3-0 already. Absolutely pointless suicide scouting, but no, no. T-43 driver disagrees. He actually did it on purpose. What on earth are you talking about, Jingles? This is perfectly normal matchmaking for a tier 7 medium tank. Why on earth would he throw his tank away deliberately at the start of the game? Well, in his own words, no, games with weak teams on public, suicide is better. And that, boys and girls, straight from the mouth of a World of Tanks player with average stats. Sometimes I really despair for the future of online gaming. Well, as you'd expect, the suicide scouting was all but pointless. Just about every single one of those tanks dropped off the radar before anybody was in a position to do anything about it. Uh, De Boer and Master Killer took what shots they could. Oh, looks like Master Killer just got a big old hit in on that Yag Tiger, and now he's turning and giving his flank. To Super De Boer, so there's his first kill. Not bad. There is a T28 down there. Uh, there he is. And wow. Now that T28 was not giving much of his side at all to Master Killer's T28, but that's just how crap the side armor of the T28 is. Never, ever give your sides to an enemy gun. Th this tank is just not capable of side scraping. The side armor is so incredibly bad it just cannot do it. 50 millimeters of side armor is all that you have and don't forget partial overmatching is going to occur if the caliber of the gun shooting at you is at least 100 millimeters and these are tier 8 tank destroyers. It's going to be difficult to find guns shooting at you that aren't going to be 100 millimeters in caliber. Never give your side armor to anybody when you're in a T28. 10 to 15 degrees of angling at the very most, otherwise they'll just shoot you in the side, and they will penetrate. Now, yeah, the writing's probably on the wall for this T-150. <laughs> yeah, I think it's fairly safe to say they got him. You, um, you, you really don't want to be in a T-150 and see two T-28s coming over the 
the, the ridge on your immediate left flank. Generally speaking, things are not going to go very well for you. And to be fair to the team, you know, that wasn't a bad counterattack. They completely crushed everything that was down this side of the map. Unfortunately, the enemy team has done the same on the other side of the map. And that means they've got a clear run into their base to go for the flag. So, who are the only tanks on the team that bother to turn around <laughs> and go and do something about it? Yep, that's right. The two slowest tanks on the team. I swear, sometimes watching what goes on in a random battle in World of Tanks makes about as much sense as the plot of a Mexican soap opera. Ah, is 3s coming back with them as well. Well, fantastic. Uh, no, good for him for being one of the few players on the team that have the common sense to react to the bloody obvious. This T-34 is in a world of trouble, though. He's got three guns firing at him. A 105mm, a 120mm, and a 122mm. And there's an A43, and... Bingo! Ammo rack! <laughs> Those are always funny. <laughs> Not for the guy on the receiving end, of course. Meanwhile, the guys that have rushed south to kill artillery are getting themselves into all kinds of predictable trouble. Um, and our two T-28s as well as the IS-3, and you know what, well played to this IS-3 driver, he's actually gone up to the forest surge and he's spotting the guys in the cap for the T-28s behind him, and he's doing plenty of damage to them himself. Super the Bird doesn't have a shot at the heavy, so he goes for the VK instead. Three targets spotted, artillery's trying to take a pop, misses, he kills him. Meanwhile, everybody on the team who ran south, full of piss and vinegar, have been, uh, well, in the case of the Hellcat, chased after the GW Panther, drove right past the GW Tiger P, and got shotgunned by the GW Tiger P. Wish I could have seen that happening. The SU-100, spotted by the Hellcat, shelled by the artillery, and they're all just milling around in the open and dying. Meanwhile, the guys who've gone back to reset the cap, finally, I don't know how many shots, Super de Boer had to put into that T-32, but no idea where half of them went. But he finally got the killing blow on him. Now, one tank left in the cap circle. And he's not stupid. He's using that dead IS-3 for cover like a boss, and he's spotting them for enemy artillery. Bang. Now that was not a direct hit. But the side armour of the T-28 is so incredibly bad that a splash damage from a GW Panther took half of his health off. He has to keep moving. The GW Tiger P is going to be aiming. He's, he's just, he's got to close the distance. Now he fired at the wrong side of the IS-3's armour and it bounced. But Master Killer got him and now watch this. Now that was an artillery hit but it hit the front of the tank. And bang, there we go, same again. Both artillery just fired, they're obviously talking to each other, they both went for separate T-28, but their shots landed in front of the T-28, where he does have 203 millimeters of armor, and they both took minimal damage from it. Now in Master Killer's case, it wasn't a direct hit. The GW Tiger P missed him by about a meter, but the shot landed in front of him, where he has his strongest armor, so he only took about 200 damage from it. In Super de Boer's case, he took a direct hit from the GW Tiger P, but it hit him on the only spot on the tank where his top armour is better than 25mm, right at the front, where it's actually 133 or 203 millimetres thick, and the only damage he took was it knocked his gun out. Well, a near miss from the GW Panther earlier did over 500 damage through his side armour. If, if the GW Panther had hit him, anywhere else other than where he hit him, he'd have been dead. And it's at more or less this point where the T-43 driver, who suicided at the start because that's the best thing he could do in this game, displays a monumental lack of self-awareness by having a go at the Tiger driver for not being very good. <laughs> that, on the other hand, was a good shot. Um, Hellcat moving at full speed gave it exactly the right amount of lead, planted a shot right into his side. Now, did he get spotted? I guess we're going to find out pretty soon. 
He doesn't have Sixth Sense on the Commander on this tank. I don't even know if he has a 100% crew. But he definitely doesn't have Sixth Sense. And no incoming artillery fire, so I guess that means he didn't get spotted. Now, tricky situation. It's two against three. One T-28 prototype and two artillery. Now, the other thing about the T-28 prototype that makes it better than the T-28 is it has better view range. It's an open-topped vehicle, after all. Now, it doesn't have much better view range. It only has 10 metres more, 370 versus 380, which isn't a lot if you're advancing against each other across an open field. But he's not going to be advancing towards them across an open field. He's going to be camping in a bush somewhere, and that's going to drastically reduce the range at which these two guys are going to see him while he's spotting them for artillery, if he's any good. Yeah, that's a big if. <laughs> I mean, I, I never claim to be the world's greatest World of Tanks player, but it seems obvious to me that if your two targets are two of the biggest artillery magnets in the game, and they have to cross open ground to get to you, it might be a good idea, especially if you have the view range advantage, to, oh, I don't know, maybe occupy some high ground behind a bush <laughs> like that ridge line that they have to pass under in order to get anywhere near the remaining tanks on the enemy team and spot them for artillery is it just me apparently it's just me I'm certainly not hearing any artillery Although, that T-28 prototype has not been spotted this entire game. And just because there are no numbers next to his name doesn't mean he hasn't been damaging any enemy tanks. So, you know, he could be very, very, very good. But it's more likely that he's very, very, very bad. Let's be honest here. If he was going to be in a position to spot them coming, we'd have known about it by now. They'd both be dead. And they're not, so yeah, he probably sucks. Which is good news. Well, we're kind of approaching the moment of truth now, and I fully expect all three of them to be right down the bottom of this road, in the bushes, around the farmhouse, in the bottom corner of the map. Wouldn't surprise me at all if they have never left that position the entire game. Well, we know that the GW Panther has. He hightailed it out of there, running away from the uh, friendly Hellcat earlier on, and the friendly Hellcat drove right past the GW Target P and got shotgunned by him. I'd be getting really nervous now if I was driving one of these T-28s, because you know what artillery's cloaking devices are like. They're going to be down there, in the bushes, hidden, waiting for you to come. Or so you'd think. But you see, this is one of those occasions where the ridiculously slow speed of the T-28 has actually worked to their advantage. What's actually happened here is those guys were camping those bushes, but the T-28s took so long to crawl all the way around the map that those guys have convinced themselves that these two T-28s are still camping in the forest. They've come to that conclusion because the T-28 prototype wouldn't go up on the ridge line and scout for them, and they've picked precisely the wrong moment to leave cover and go looking for them. <laughs> Sometimes being in one of the slowest machines in the game has its advantages. Now all they have to do is find and kill the T-28 prototype, and he's no faster than they are. <laughs> And there's two of them, so they actually have a chance. Um, of course, we have no idea where he is. So at this stage, they can still win by capping. And that guy could be halfway across the map in the middle of the Magic Forest looking for them by now. So I think that's pretty much going to be their plan. At this point, they can either win by capping or force him to come back and face them and win that way by killing him. And there he is. He didn't actually make it that far. Oh, Super Debur takes a hit, but he manages to get return fire in. He switched to APCR here. Wants to make sure. 
but his frontal armour is no better <laughs> than the T28 prototypes. Master Killer penetrates him, advances. It looks like. Oh, he manages to bounce a shot. It looked like he angled just a little bit there, right at the point where he fired. Then he misses. Oh, come on, don't make a meal of it. Okay, yeah, front armour. Not actually that good at all. They're both just penetrating each other, but Master Killer has enough health to take another hit. He just needs to spot him again. Come on. It means he's going to have to move forward. There he is. He's going to get the next shot off. Yeah, there we go. Finally. <laughs> and with 12 kills between the two of them, six each, that's a crucial contribution. No top gun for Super De Boer, but he did get Confederate as well. And that's because, well, Master Killer had the 120mm gun. He did more damage, over 6,000, so he gets the top gun. Final replay comes from Camper 03, and with a name like that, I suspect he either drives a lot of tank destroyers or he's a very, very bad KV-1S driver. This, by the way, since patch 9.2 was released, is the highest damage-dealing game uploaded to worldoftanksreplay.com in a T-28. Now, just hold on to that thought. Right? It's the most damage anybody has done and uploaded to worldoftanksreplays.com while driving a T-28. And, as you can see, he's got a mark of mastery on the barrel, the 120mm barrel of his T-28, so he clearly drives this tank quite a bit. Now, it is, of course, a T-28, and it's going to take him a long, long time to get into position, so... We're going to skip ahead to when he spots his first target and gets to fire his first shot here in this Tier 8 encounter battle on Prokhorovka. And eventually, here he is. In case anybody's interested, according to XVM, this match is a 49 percenter, so the teams on paper are pretty evenly matched. Of course, what XVM cannot predict is how well or poorly individuals are going to play in any one given game. But still, 49% this is by no means an assured win. So he's camping at the back. Because he's in a T28. If you're looking for fast, nail-biting, seat-of-the-pants, pulse-pounding gameplay, you're, you're watching the wrong tank review. <laughs> he's in a T28. These things don't do fast. He's at the back, covering the cap circle. They've got tanks on the hill. If the guys in the middle could stop dying, the only thing they have left there is a T29. And the T29 is capping, and it's not being opposed. That means there are no enemy tanks in the cap circle. But they're four tanks down, and they haven't killed anything yet. Now they've got guys over on the western road. And there's not too many of them there. Remember, this is Encounter. The action's all over on this side. But you do kind of have to watch that other side of the map in case anybody tries to sneak over and outflank. And there's no artillery in this game. Here comes his first victim. T-28 prototype. Fires his first shot, and it doesn't even go in the same postcode as where he aimed it. But, reloads. Fires again. T-28's hit. And he keeps coming. And then he gets hit again, and he still keeps coming. <laughs> and then Camper reloads and hits him again, and he still keeps coming. And then he dies. <laughs> so, yeah. You can never predict what somebody's going to do. That's one thing that XVM cannot do for you. And it's surprising how quickly this 120mm gun does actually fire, because this is the same gun that you get on the T-34 tier 8 heavy premium American tank, and that thing is legendary for its slow rate of fire. So the rate of fire of this gun on the T-28 is actually not bad. And when this gun behaves itself, it's an incredibly good gun. He really does not have much of that AMX M4 to shoot at. He's firing over the railway embankment and under the bottom of the railway cars, and he's hitting nearly every shot and getting decent damage rolls. So, what's this? Looks like an Indian Panzer. Yeah.
again, he doesn't have an awful lot to shoot at. I never get shots like that when I'm driving my T28. Although, you know, having said that, I have once, while driving the T95, fired on the move while shooting at an AMX 1375 300 metres away and hit him, so yeah, anything's possible. Now, Tiger coming over the top of the hill. And he's dropped out of view range. No longer being spotted. He's not the only one up there either. Takes a shot at the T69, who's encroached on the cap. They are losing 410, by the way, in case it wasn't obvious. Everybody in the cap circle's dead. The enemy team are now capping. There goes the Tiger, and he has been spotted. Also, in case it's not obvious, what that Tiger has actually managed to do is drive down from a position on the hill to a spot where he's got two tank destroyers in front of him and a T-69 behind him. <laughs> so, yeah, he's dead. They're pulling the scores back now. Um, the AT-15 on the western side of the map is having a monster game over there. And there's another kill. He's taken hits, but he's only taken hits from a T-69. The T-69, at this kind of range, hell, even at point-blank range from the front, the T-69, unless he's firing high-explosive anti-tank ammo, and he isn't, has absolutely no chance of penetrating the front of a T-28. Even the Tiger with 203mm of penetration, at that kind of range, because don't forget, the penetration listed for your gun is at 100 metres or less. So at 300 metres, you stand a significantly lower chance of actually penetrating the same amount of armour. At these kind of ranges, the 203mm frontal armour of the T-28 is actually pretty good. There was even a ridiculously optimistic E-25 firing at the front of his tank from god knows what range there. I mean, the E-25 couldn't penetrate the front of a T-28 from point-blank range. Couldn't even hurt it if he opened the front hatch and posted the shells through. <laughs> it, was just, it just doesn't have the penetration. Now, of course, well, they've pulled the scores back and it looks like the western flank is completely secure. There's only the AT-15 left over there. T-69's moving up, challenging the cap. Enemy tank in the cap circle, he's been hit. And he's withdrawn, he's pulled out of the cap circle. At this point, and Camper realised it well in advance, you've got to stop camping at the back and you've got to start moving up. And that's a very, very valuable skill to have, knowing when is the right time to move when you're in anything as slow as the T-28. Now, he has been spotted. And there it is. Another T-28. He fires, penetrates. T-28 fires and penetrates. He tried to angle while not angling so much that he gave that guy even the slightest hint of a shot at his side. He's bouncing the T-69 again with ease. T-69's back right off, stands no chance of penetrating the front. t 28 backing off. Doesn't want to give that T-69 any kind of shot at his side armour. The AT-15, who has done a fantastic job over on the Western Road, has now satisfied himself that there's no longer any danger over there, and he's now advancing very slowly, because he's in an AT-15, across the middle of the map to come and support these guys. Now, Camper is capping, although this game is never going to be decided by who caps first, or if it does, then somebody screwed up. But the fact that he is accumulating capture points tells him a couple of things. It tells him that none of the enemy tanks are in the cap circle, and that's good news, because it means he's keeping them at medium range, where his armour still mostly works. And the T-69 makes a very foolish move. They've spotted the AT-15 coming, and they think they're going to get some easy shots at him, but he puts himself... Well, he just made it easy for Camper. Side of the T-69 on low health. Easy kill. However, now there's somebody else in the cap circle, and he really, really doesn't want to get into close combat with this thing. For one thing, his armour isn't that good at close range, and two, he doesn't want to get outflanked. But he also doesn't want to just abandon the cap circle to them. They've lost their own T-69. There's only three of them left. The SU-152... Sorry, the ISU-152, he only has the SU-152's gun, has finally started moving forward. But he's now in the low ground and he doesn't have any effective shots on these guys in the cap. So it's all down to Camper and the AT-15. And the AT-15 is doing a fantastic job. He's come over the railway line and he's given them what they think is an easy target. 
He nails the enemy T-28. The enemy Yag Tiger. Oh, that's a bad, bad move, Mr. Yag Tiger. You don't give the side of your tank to a T-28 with a 120mm gun. Camera's going to punish you for that. Two good, solid hits. Now, he has managed to force the AT-15 to back off over the railway line, but now he can't do anything. He can't go forward over the railway line, or the AT-15 shoots into his lower glacis, and he can't back up to deal with Camper. So, he's really caught between a rock and a hard place here. The enemy AT-15 fires and bounces. Camper does not. Camper only has two rounds of armor-piercing ammunition left. After this, he's using APCR, but he's got a shot at that big, fat German ass. He backs up a little... Gets the shot, takes it, kills the Yag Tiger 88. AT-15 bounces. The ISG-152's finally made it, and then, of course, misses. <laughs> and, and Camper finishes off the AT-15 with his last round of armor-piercing ammunition. So, Camper 03. Good game. It's Ace Tanker in the T-28. It's 6,600 damage done, high caliber, and a steel wall medal. That, as of the time I recorded this video, is the single most damage done in a T-28 uploaded to worldoftanksreplay.com since patch 9.2 was released. The interesting thing is that if you were to expand that selection to include all of the other Tier 8 tank destroyers, this match from Camper 03, which is the most damage anybody has done in a T-28 since patch 9.2 was released and uploaded it to worldoftanksreplays.com, this match appears on page 10 of the list. The top two, surprisingly, are T-28 prototypes. Now, I do realise that this is not a particularly scientific method of evaluating the worth of a vehicle, but, interestingly, if you were to further expand that search to include all the previous versions of World of Tanks, T-28 prototype games start appearing on page 3. So what that does tell me is that this machine is experiencing a massive drop in popularity. Nobody really wants to play it. And, well, is anybody really surprised? It's a T-28. So, the T-28. Um, it really is a bad tank. <laughs> this thing is easily, easily, beyond any shadow of a doubt, the worst of the Tier 8 tank destroyers. The AMX-48 is way better than this machine. Even the T-28 prototype is better than this machine, and that's not very good either. But I kind of like it anyway. It's got a certain charm all of its own. Um, that's probably not going to be much help to anybody who's thinking of getting this thing, or is having to grind through it on the way to the T-95 and the T-110 E3. But you will have some memorable games when you're playing the T-28. I can promise you that if only because they stand out in such stark contrast <laughs> to the majority of the disasters that you have when you're driving it. It's not a very good machine, but it certainly has character, and character goes far. As always, folks, uh, take care on that battlefield, and I'll catch you next time.